Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome to another instalment of Lee and the IC, the podcast in which we here at the Investors Chronicle get to pick the mind of one of the UK's most successful and best known personal investors, Lord John Lee. I'm Alex Newman, an associate editor at the Investors Chronicle, with the honour of once again doing the picking here at the Financial Times studios. First, the quick disclaimer that everything we talk about on this podcast is filtered through the thoughts, actions, feelings and experience of one individual. So that means that while our discussion is intended purely as an educational tool, we're often giving one angle in the multitude of views that make up a market. Of course, nothing in this podcast should be taken as financial advice or a recommendation to buy or sell shares. This month, we've got a fair bit to unpack. There's been a big development in the world of UK private investors, the consequences of which I'm keen to get John's thoughts on. We'll also be checking in on the shares for schools idea that John's been campaigning for, as well as fielding some reader questions. And with earnings season in full swing, we'll conclude by checking in on some results in John's portfolio and how he intends to use any dividend windfalls coming his way in the coming months. Enough preamble. John, thanks as ever for giving up your time to chat. How are you doing? My pleasure. Thank you. So a fortnight ago, the government used the budget to flesh out proposals for a a so-called British ISA. Too much questioning, some derision, some cautious optimism, including on our magazine. Um, This week, John, you wrote, it looks administratively complex, will only benefit the really well off and unsurprisingly has hardly delivered a flicker of reaction in markets. Do I take from that you're not resoundingly positive. <laughs> I think that would be a fairly uh, a fairly sound observation on my comments. Uh, yes, I think it's a damp squib, okay. basically. Um, you know, having said that, uh, I'm a great supporter of ISIS and obviously um, have done very well from them over the years. I think, I think they're a great rapper. Also, of course, I'm very supportive of any initiatives and ideas uh, that will stimulate investment in the UK stock market, which obviously is pretty depressed at the, at the present time. But I don't think this particular uh, British ISA, uh, the five thousand pound one, actually um, you know is the answer and is going to make much difference. And I think is actually going to overcomplicate things. What is it about the structure then? You think it's not really going to deliver? Well, I think the basic problem is, as far as I can tell, and and I think it, I think the detail is up for discussion. It would appear to me and others that I've talked to that essentially you're going to have to talk about a separate. £5,000 or up to £5,000 British ISA uh, alongside the ISA that hopefully uh, the majority of listeners have already got. That is a, you know, a, a, a hurdle. Uh, I wouldn't have thought, you know, the platforms, the Hargreaves, Lansdowne, the AJ Bells and what have you, interactive investors will be terribly excited about uh, about that. And it, it, it just adds another uh, complication in, in my view. Uh, and I think there's a much simpler route which i'm happy to talk about yeah just just to um return to a theme that we, we've discussed a fair few times on this podcast i mean you've said that uh, you think a shift in cultural attitudes is is what's really needed um for i suppose uh, any kind of revolution in 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 private investing in, in the uk and that said incentives tools and policies are are important and you know the 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 things that a government would would typically use to try and kick start a cultural change if if that's if that's what they want to do i mean short of a change in culture how might else do you think that you know this or the next government can achieve this broadly stated goal of harnessing the uk stock market to to improve domestic investment well i think there are a number of possible initiatives um you know one is uh, the idea of the natwest shares for schools which we can mm. talk about uh, a little later i'm in favor of uh, a british stock limited isa uh, my suggestion actually is that is that as of now because i think it would be very difficult it would be very difficult to ask people to disinvest overseas holdings from their from their isas but looking to the future, I think I think the rules should change. And I says in the future, maybe the 20 plus the five, uh, if we go ahead with that extra five, should be limited to uh, investment in UK stocks. Uh, if people want to invest overseas, and, and obviously they've done very, very well um, investing in some of the big American stocks in, in recent years, 
Uh, I've, been, I've missed out, not been an easy two or three years for me because I'm 100% um, UK. But I don't see that we should give tax relief or tax incentives to Baron ISA to encourage people to invest overseas. Uh, and therefore, I, I would limit ISA in the future to, um, uh, to UK equities. And then also, uh, and this has been a, uh, a, you know, a big um, gripe of mine, uh, I would really encourage government to, to bring in the heads of the television companies and um, uh, maybe with the regulators uh, and really um, endeavour to, to bring about uh, some real significant coverage of uh, UK businesses and UK quoted companies and the stock market uh, in television. Uh, we, so far, there's been near zero um, uh, contribution or interest from from television in the stock market. And I think it, it's been a, you know, a big, uh, big national loss, frankly. Just sticking with the 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 point on uh, overseas shares exemption, tax exemption within within ISAs. T- I totally take the point. The suggestion. I think you, you said to me the other day. You, you can see why it's it's controversial, given that I, I suppose it's not just the point about. Um, the US stock market having done so well, it's the view now that the ISA is the vehicle towards a diversified portfolio, which many people define as, as as globally diversified. Do you think removing the overseas tax break itself would then incentivize UK share ownership, or is just going to lead to to pushback from from people who are in the in the in the camp just? You know, just well, I, I, I'm not suggesting that that those who already have got overseas yeah. holdings should should uh, should divest them. But I think once again, it would it would just increase the focus mm. on UK stock market. I think the efforts that the government is making to encourage pension funds to be far more transparent and and to uh, really think much more seriously about investing in the UK stock market and exposing the fact that there's such a small percentage at the moment uh, of many and most pension funds uh, invested in the UK stock market, and not least the, the, parliamentary, uh, the parliamentary pension scheme, which has got a very small percentage in, in the UK stock market. Um, th- you know, things like that, I think, would be, um, would be beneficial. I suppose the the idea that it would be administratively burdensome, I suppose, kind of applies to the British ISA as currently touted. So, I mean, obviously you have, you know, certain global equity investment trusts where how do we categorise those? But it, it's, a, it's a question to be worked out, I suppose. And yes, maybe but, it's I mean, a point there obviously are details. Raising, yeah. But, I mean, my fundamental point is, yes, we want to encourage uh, ISAs. And, and, of course, now, you know, they are regarded as, as um, you know, wonderful tax-free wrapper. Uh, and my sort of foreign friends are very, very envious of, of the uh, of the wrapper and the advantage we have here. But I think it's a very fair question. Um, should we be giving tax incentives to allow people or to encourage people to invest overseas? It really is as simple as that. Do you think, as some have argued, that what's needed as part of all this reform, potentially, of, of ICE, is, is one, simplification, and two, to to kind of change the marketing of... Uh, and emphasise its tax-free status. I mean, individual savings account is a bit dry and vague in some ways, don't you think? I mean, you've you've lived through the PEP era. You know, you've seen how the branding has, has shifted over the years. Do you think there's a new uh, an argument for a new change? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I th- I think um, you know, amongst those who who've who've got resource and got cash, I, you know, I think there's been a huge acceptance of of um, uh, of ISIS and a big uh, big growth. Uh, and of course, um, you know, last weekend's press, and, and no doubt the coming weekend, as, as we approach, you know, the the tax year end, um, you know, we'll have big supplements on uh, on ISAs. But there are other things that can help. For I mean, for example, you know, the the the, the junior ISA that uh, can be taken out for y- for young people, and I've mm. done I've done that through my through my uh, through my daughter. You know, I'm not allowed as a grandparent to to take out. Uh, a junior ISA for my grandchildren. Mm. Um, no, no, no. They say you know only a parent can do that. So one can do it, but one has to give the money to yeah. uh, to a, a, your own child to, to do it for, for for the grandchildren. You know that something like that, for example. I mean, why why prohibit the grandparent from from starting and encouraging? Uh, a grandchild on the road of uh, of investment, in, in, you know, in a direct way, things can be made easier. Yeah, indeed. So, Professor Nigel Savage, uh, who's a, a listener and a, a seasoned small cap investor like yourself, got he got in touch to say that he is a bit put off by another element of the tax treatment of 
ISAs, and that's specifically around the inheritance tax that is applied to ISA accounts, which still fall under inheritance tax in many instances, though with some notable exceptions, some AIM-listed shares of business relief status. Um, I mean, his, his feeling is that the IHT-managed ISA portfolios come with high charges and fees, but that actually navigating all of this is really complicated for a private investor because there's no clear list or guidance on which shares qualify for IHT. Do, how, how do you navigate all of this, John, if at all? Or is it just not, is it, is it a consideration if you're looking at an aim listed share, whether it qualifies? Well, I t- clearly I take it into account. I mean, I think that it's an interesting point. I think fundamentally, we, we one could actually make uh, an ISA up to a certain level free of inheritance tax, full stop. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, that also would be a, an encouragement, once again, provided, it's, provided you're investing in British stocks. That would be a plus and a boost to, to ISAs if they were overall um, free of inheritance tax. Uh, at the present time, it is, it is uh, rather messy uh, in that within an ISA, it's, it is the AIM stocks and, and only approved AIM stocks uh, that carry at the moment inheritance tax relief held for two years. I think I'm right in saying. Um, and, of course, we're not helped by the fact that the, the Indian Revenue will not say which AIM shares are exempt and which aren't. Yeah. Uh, I mean, why they're, they're reluctant or incapable of doing that, uh, I really don't know. I mean, that makes life much more difficult. But I've got a number of AIM shares in, in my portfolio. Uh, but companies that, that, you know, stand stand up to my normal tests, as it were, and satisfy the normal criteria that one looks for in investment... But then uh, additionally, one has the, the or hopefully has the inheritance tax relief as well. So uh, once again, uh, you know, this whole area could be given a boost. Is, is that something j- just in terms of the practicality you would check with your broker when you're... Well, you well the, you see, the, see, the broker, the, but there is no authoritative list or guide. Really? Okay. So uh, you can talk to a broker about it and... and you talk to can talk to individual companies, and and some of them say you know we believe we are or we regard ourselves as, as being you know a qualifying company for for IHT purposes. But um, you know there there is no guarantee because there is no approved list, and uh, uh, you know I think this is just a, a you know another another uh, absurdity, frankly. Uh, incidentally, the the idea that a British ISA could contain an element of, of inheritance tax exemption up to a defined limit of threshold is, is an idea that um, Professor Savage has also um, floated. So I think he's with you on that one. Good. So the, the, the British ISA hasn't been the only uh, interface with the, the Treasury you've had in, in recent weeks. Um, John, there's also been a bit more movement in your idea to include secondary schools in the proposed public sale of NatWest shares. Can you just briefly, one, I suppose, remind listeners of, of the idea and then, two, what feedback you've you've had and where things are at now. Sure. The idea basically came to me two or three months ago uh, in the context of, of becoming increasingly aware that the government uh, were considering disposing of the remainder of their NatWest holding via the, the TELSID route, in other words, involving the members of, uh, members of the public. Uh, and uh, it, it occurred to me that uh, what would be what would be marvelous and transformative, uh, would be if government considered giving a, a small uh, quantity of the NatWest shares as a gift to all our state secondary schools, because I think it's it's common ground that um, financial awareness in our state schools, indeed all schools, is really very, very limited indeed. And so our youngsters are being turned out with very little knowledge of, of, of what a bank is, what the stock market is, uh, and uh, what a dividend is. Uh, and so my idea uh, would be that the government gifted, say, £5,000 to each secondary school to be held for the long term if the schools wanted it. It's, it's not, it wouldn't be compulsory. Um, and at the, the current time, £5,000 for the NetWest shares would uh, deliver a, a dividend of about £350. And, 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 and this really is the key thing that the decision on how to spend that £350 would be would rest with the pupils. So they would decide by, by way of vote. That would be up to the school to organise, presumably the senior levels of, uh, hmm. of youngsters. And they would decide, uh, so they could decide, for example, 
to buy an item for, you know, for the school laboratory or for the school, to subsidise a school trip, um, to support a local charity, a local food bank, or e and consider even reinvesting that £350 dividend. But the key point is they would be empowered for the first time. Mm. Uh, then also, clearly because the school would, would own the shares, they could attend by Zoom the NatWest AGM. And I would uh, suggest that NatWest would be very willing to, to send you know, senior people in to talk to the schools about uh, about um, you know, the bank and how it operates. Uh, and then, if we could get this off the ground, um, then I believe we should try and encourage regional public companies to donate a small number of shares, maybe you know, £1,000 worth of mm. shares to, say, the half a dozen state secondary schools in their locality mm. where their employees' children go to school and where they recruit from, or will recruit from, and this would, bridge, would build a real bridge between those companies uh, in the locality and the and the and the youngsters, which would be a plus, and it would be giving the youngsters an, an increased awareness and financial knowledge. Now, this is a unique opportunity. This is the this is the the key point, really. It only arises because the government's got the NatWest shares uh, and is planning, as far as we know, to go down this Telsid route. Mm -hmm. So it's an opportunity that will never come again. And the total cost with just over 4,000 state secondary schools would be about £22 million, which really is a, a drop in the ocean considering the government's got about, I think, about £15 billion worth of NatWest mm -hmm. shares that it, it, needs to, it, it needs to sell. So this is an idea that I have to tell you, everyone, but everyone, both, both inside Parliament and outside that I've talked to about it, um, thinks it's a great idea. Uh, and um, uh, we've written to the Chancellor, uh, and I've had meetings with the Schools Minister uh, and with the Economic Secretary of the Treasury to explain it in, in more detail. The media are now becoming coming on board uh, to support the, the idea, and, and uh, if listeners like the idea and, um, you know, could think about maybe writing to their MP and or writing letters to the paper, you know, that would be hugely appreciated. But it is a unique opportunity mm. Of, of really, for the first time, beginning to seriously raise financial awareness. And when we realise also that more of our young people now um, speculate, don't invest, speculate in cryptocurrencies than actually invest in a traditional form, mm. we, should, we should all be actually quite concerned and rather ashamed of that. There was some suggestion, I think, that the share sale may take place in June. I mean, I don't think any of the, the details on, on the, the NatWest disposal have been, uh, have been fully announced or, or fleshed out. But I expect we'll probably get more information on all of this in the in the coming weeks. And I noted that um, I mean Har Hargreaves Lansdowne put out a, a a piece on the website suggesting that retail offers can often take place at short notice and and then happen very quickly. Have you ever participated in the past? In I, mean, I know we had Royal Mail a few years ago. I, can't, I well, we had a whole number. I mean, I remember when I was in you know in in, in Parliament, uh, we had a whole number of um, privatisations, and indeed I. Uh, one of the favorite, my favorite questions in any stock market quiz, is to say to people, if you'd in, if you'd invested in all the government privatizations uh, of the of the Thatcher era, um, which would have done the best? Right. And no one, I have to tell you, no one has got the correct answer. Okay. Um, Don't ask. Uh, you know, me. they say <laughs> water or or gas or or um, British Airways, but the answer is the answer is associated British ports. Okay. Which, which um, uh, you know, was, has been by far the most successful privatisation in financial terms, uh, ultimately taken over by, um, uh, you know, by the Australians. I think it was Macquarie who bought it, so it's no longer a public company. Um, they were a great success. I can't remember whether I ever personally applied for any of the privatisations. I, I did have a few Associated British ports very early on, a very small quantity that I sold, uh, sadly. Uh, much too soon, um, but uh, uh, obviously, if the NatWest shares do come on offer, I think they could be quite attractive because the yield at the moment is about seven percent. They would have to be offered as a discount to the market, so therefore the yield probably would be, you know, seven and a half to eight percent. You know, very big bank. I think most of the banks are you know pretty well run these days and pretty well capitalised, uh, and um, so uh, you know, I would have thought. Uh, could be successful, and uh, you know I'm sorry that some some of the commentators 
are a little bit lukewarm towards the uh, the concept. Well, let's 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 watch this space. Um, it'll be interesting to see the, the NatWest share sale play out, but um, even more so with this uh, with this campaign as well, and, and see how that that goes, John. So. We often talk on this podcast, I suppose, on a fairly high level about investing. But as we've discussed, practicalities matter a great deal too. So I was, I was really pleased, actually, to receive a few questions on the nuts and bolts of your own portfolio management, John. One comes from Andrew Jefford. He wants to know if you use stop losses, which I think for anyone unfamiliar with um, how these work, it's if if the share price of a company you hold drops below a certain level, there is an automatic sale placed to 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 sort of safeguard against very steep falls. Um, Andrew writes that as anyone who has invested in small caps will know that the market reacts brutally to bad news and bad narratives, and it's not uncommon for the investment gains of years to be wiped out in a few se- sessions on negative sentiment. Um, so. So yeah, that's 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 the question that I, I suppose he he's putting. Do you do you manage your portfolio in that way, or you have limits or an order? Uh, no, by and large, no. Um, I I've, I haven't really operated with stop losses over the the years. I think if one was going to bring one in, I think you have to be talking about a twenty percent stop loss. In other words, if if something you buy has gone down twenty percent, then maybe. But frankly. Uh, in the in the small cap arena, which is my prime focus, um, movements can be very very lumpy, mm. um, uh, you know, and only a small uh, small volume trade, uh, and so one can get sort of you know five ten percent swings very very easily both ways. Um, so I, I tend not to worry too much about stop losses if I believe in the fundamentals of the business, or, although I have to say. It probably would be a fair criticism of me to say that I have been probably too loyal to too too many companies for too for too, for too long. But uh, there we are. Uh, I hold my hands up to uh, to that. I'm a, I am essentially a long term investor. Mm. Uh, I'm certainly not a trader. But it's an important point, I suppose, even for traders. It cuts both ways, doesn't it? When liquidity is is short, then you might be selling at a point which you know prior to a recovery then yeah well i think i think that's right i think the more interesting question frankly and and the one that is the most difficult to answer is is, um uh, you know about about selling when Mm. you when you made a good profit uh and um uh i've really i've suffered over the last two or three years because you know a number of my holdings which which were very highly rated like you know like treat like ampario like lock and store you know have been substantially derated um, uh, and one's seen, you know, quite a negative reaction uh, in their share prices. Uh, maybe they were they were uh, somewhat overcooked mm. originally, but probably they've fallen somewhat too far now, as it were. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's it, it's not easy to know when to take a profit. Maybe to consider top sl- top slicing. You know, the, 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 it's a very difficult judgment, I think. Yeah, there, there you go. I've, I've certainly not solved it anyway, put it yeah. that way. There you go. After six, you know, 60 years of investing, perfect hindsight still uh, gnaws at no, no one get no, <laughs> no one gets everything right, I can assure you. Uh, so Andrew and another listener who, whose name I've misplaced also wondered how you monitor prices, get your information, etc. So how do you, you know, on a day-to-day basis, how are you checking in on your portfolio? Well, I have my, uh, you know, my portfolio on my on my iPad, so I can, you know, I can pretty well check movements. Usually uh, I uh, log in around seven o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, checking any company results and uh, any announcements. I, you know, I, I enjoy doing that anyway. And at the end of the day, most days, um, uh, stockbroker that I use is the, you know, they send me a printout of my uh, uh, of my of my portfolio with with you know any any days movements clearly uh, clearly shown. So I, I you know keep in touch on on a daily basis and and even, indeed during the day, yeah. uh, focusing on one or two uh, particularly large holdings to see what's happening there. Um, not that I'm you know looking to to trade or take action necessarily. But but you know it's part of my life and I enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't enjoy it, you're not interested in it, then uh, best uh, best leave it to some someone else to manage your portfolio to go through a fund. But I actually enjoy investing in individual companies, as you know, uh, and following their fortunes. 
another listener, David Winterbottom, is keen to know what you use, I suppose, by way of, of potentially software tools or otherwise to generate investment ideas. Do you do you do you use any any software or is it you know just more a, a general approach of of, of of what you read it's more a question of uh, of reading um and uh, you know then maybe digging into a, a particular company you know its website mm. and it, its rns statements um so uh you know obviously i, I read the city columns uh, and uh, read the investor chronicle uh, and obviously you know financial times uh, particularly at the uh, at the weekends uh, and uh, then I'm a member of um, uh, a sort of little breakfast investment group and a, a lunch investment group and a dinner investment group uh, where ideas are exchanged. Thankfully, they don't all fall on the same day. Otherwise, I would be <laughs> some, somewhat... Too many ideas, uh, somewhat, too many meals. Somewhat yeah. obese, yes. <laughs> um, and occasionally, you know, one or two interesting thoughts come up there that I follow up and, and check. Um but because obviously I've been investing for a long, long time, I'm I'm pretty well aware of of you know all existing companies that have been around for a good few years. I don't find it easy to to monitor you know some of the newer companies that come along, uh, and I, I I do miss out uh, on that area. But um, I don't uh, use any sophisticated software, as it were. I'm a little bit more of a you know a broad a broad brush man for sure. David, it appears, is also a long-time fan and noting that it's been about a decade since you published uh, How to Make a Million Slowly, which was your, I suppose, your, your kind of career in investing. Wondering whether you're going to, you're considering writing a sequel. Is that something on the cards? Uh, I muse about it from time to time, but but no present, um, uh, present plans. Uh, I did produce, of course, um, you know, a book two or three years ago called Yummy Yogurt, a first taste of stock market investment, which was focused really on on beginners. Very short, simple read, uh, only a 30-odd pages to try and give the basics of, of investment. And, of course, I'm still writing my quarterly Financial Times column in FT Money. And, uh, you know, the next one comes out, I think, around the, uh, uh, the 23rd of uh, this month. Yeah. Well... It's, it's the 21st of March as we're recording uh, now, so I think by the time you, listeners uh, hear this, they, they will be able to read that already. We've we've typically avoided on this podcast um, making very sort of short-term commentaries or responding on a week-to-week basis on, uh, uh, you know, looking at companies uh, and markets. Um, but I thought we might make an exception for two of your companies in this episode because they've just reported Starting with the AIM listed Ampario, which is the ticker has the ticker ANP, which published published its full year results yesterday. Um, I, I believe you know it's one of the few holdings we haven't actually talked about much here. Could you sort of briefly sketch out what it does and your background as a shareholder, and then maybe we can sort of dig into mm. the results? Here. Yes, um, it's a very nice, attractive little company. Uh, that I've been a shareholder in for uh, quite a few years now. And uh, it, it has been successful. It was very successful uh, and was much more highly rated. And uh, the, the rating, as with the number, has has come down in recent years. But it, 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 it really ticks. For me, it, it really ticks all the boxes. The business essentially provides stimulants, natural stimulants, for animal growth. Additives, in other words, for, for food, for feed, for... Uh, poultry and and pigs and uh, there's an aquaculture uh, involvement for for fishes for fish as well and uh, 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 and um, uh, other animals. So it, it so th- these are natural additives and of course there is a there is a big move away from chemicals and toxic uh, additives. So uh, you know they they they're really um, in the right place, doing all the right things environmentally, as it were, and from a health point of view. It's a mini global business. Uh, they, you know, they they sell their product from their uh, their plant in a workshop all over the world. Uh, I visited the plant some some years ago, uh, and they have a, a you know foothold in in a number of a number of countries. In recent years, some have done better than than others. So you know the record's been a little on the the patchy side recently. But of course, as the world population grows. Uh, and um, you know, people uh, become more affluent. Broad brush, 
uh, then really, you know, demand for food increases, for quality food increases, uh, and uh, and Paro should benefit. Uh, and it's very conservatively run. Um, they've always managed to um, to keep a, a nice um, a fund of liquidity and um, and pay. A gr- I think they've paid a, 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 an increasing dividend every year they've been public for the last you know fifteen years or so, maybe longer, fifteen twenty years. Uh, and uh, again, marginally increased it uh, in the results very recently. And the the report that came out um, on their on their results, um, I think, pointed to uh, a resumption of growth. Uh, and uh, you know, I think they're very nicely positioned to to move forward. And also, of course, like a number of uh, my smaller stocks, very vulnerable to uh, to a predator who takes advantage of, of um, you know a more modest rating. Yeah. Just, just to dive into the results in a bit more detail, a few headline highlights. The, the gross margins were up. They're, they they cited improved cash generation, like you said, the, the increased dividend. But it, it, at the same time, I think it looked like they've they've had a bit of a trickier end market because sales were down, pre-tax, pre-tax profits down a quarter. And the chairman said that meat protein producers around the world, obviously, as you alluded to, Amparo's main customers there, saw quite a lot of margin pressure higher competition, lower consumption, which hurt demand for, um, I suppose, their specialist additive products. I suppose the sound from yesterday seemed to be that they are now more efficient because of this difficult patch and that markets are improving. Is this, in your mind, a kind of a cyclical business? I wouldn't, oh, yes, I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say it's a cyclical business, uh, but I would say, uh, you know, and acknowledge, you know, you are absolutely right. I mean, they've, they've had a, you know, a difficult 12 months, mm. obviously, with inflation, there was also, and this is this is true of you know, so many industries. There was a lot of destocking, which obviously um, uh, affected them, and then of course the significant rise in uh, in um, uh, in shipping costs, transportation costs, uh, as we know. So it, you know, it's, it's not been easy. It's not been an easy period uh, for the majority of um, of normal trading sectors, as distinct from the you know the the high tech uh, arena. Um, but I think that um, uh, you know they they do have a attractive, interesting, interesting future from a very solid base. Yeah, I mean I think they returned you know ten million or so to shareholders, and and their their cash position is is, is almost back up by that figure now. So uh, it's a very nice little one to you know have tucked away, and um, I'm sure it will deliver over time. Yeah, it's a fair point as well. I mean I, I suppose you know we talk about growth stocks and and growth stories. I mean, even within a growth story, you're going to have elements of cyclicality or ebbs and uh, ebbs and wanes, uh, ebbs and flows, I suppose, within an end market or a customer mm. base. So, you know, drawing these these kind of style distinctions is not always very useful. Um, sure. A couple of UK businesses servicing similar end markets have had a tough time of late. One one is Genus, which is the the genetics group, which has has been struggling a bit. Another I noticed was Benchmark Holdings, which. Um, effectively put itself up for sale in January after deciding it was sort of materially undervalued. I mean, you, you talked about you know potential price action. Similarly, that I think you wrote in your article this year, it's about as uh, it's about as easy to anticipate a, uh, an, a takeover as it is to spot the next salmon when you're when you're fishing. <laughs> yes, but I do think I do think uh, an article that the article that I've written for the FT, um, which actually I think is on the on the the web their web now. Yeah even though it comes out a little later, is really headlined, you know, the year of the takeover. And we've already seen, uh, haven't we, uh, and it's only just, you know, we're just in, really into 20, 2024, we, we've seen a whole list of, um, uh, you know, of names, you know, the Curries and Matterley Woods. Mm. Wincanton, uh, I think a big... Sorry? Wincanton is big... Wincanton at you know, 100%, 100% premium. Who would have thought, you know, Wincanton would have, would have uh, warranted 100% premium? So um, I think uh, inevitably, as interest rates come down, uh, and therefore you know the, the, there is a greater opportunity for private equity firms to to you know to take on debt, they will be seizing and are seizing uh, the opportunities in a in an underrated and lowly rated UK stock market, uh, and that's why I think we'll see a lot of action during the year. Over my sixty years of investment life, I think I've seen pretty well uh, or been on the receiving end of uh, a takeover or a take private 
virtually every year, so I've, I've been on the receiving end of about 60 of those. The last one a couple of years ago with their partner. So we'll see what 2024 brings, but I'd be surprised if none of my stocks were bid for uh, over the next nine months or so. Yeah. Today, we also had four year numbers from MNG, ticker MNG, which we spoke about at length in our first episode, and which I believe is your biggest holding or is, my, is, is certainly my biggest holding. What were your initial reactions to the numbers? Well, I, I only, um, you know, really sort of top lined them as yeah. it were and, and, and read, the, read the basics. But uh, uh, overall, the figures seem to be good. The, uh, the growth in, in a number of uh, areas of activity a reduction in the, the cost base. New people have been brought in to head up the different the different divisions. And there was an optimistic vein throughout the statement, I thought, uh, which augurs well. The dividend was very fractionally increased, but then it was already a, a high payout anyway. Uh, I think when I was buying the shares, they were on about a 10% yield. we have gone up somewhat now, but the, the dividend yield is still about 8%. So for a company of that size, I think, you know, that is a very attractive yield, particularly, of course, in an ISA uh, where it's tax free. And so, you know, I've had over, I've had very positive announcements on the dividend front in the last few weeks from from, you know, my big holdings in this sector, like Legal and General and Aviva and, as you say, M&G. Uh, and all, all sort of tax-free within an ISA, you know, I think these are incredible opportunities and in income sense balance some of the smaller cap stocks where the dividend payout is and the dividend yield is is um, is lower. But uh, to have a block of these at the present time in your ISA tax-free, I think, is, uh, is a great opportunity. Yeah, and we can maybe come on to your potential use of, of those dividends and also comparisons within the sector. Just to stay with for a moment more the results as they were for M&G. I mean, everything looks pretty positive. At the same time, you know, this is quite a complex, multifaceted business, maybe getting more complex because unlike a lot of their peers, they are, you know, they're thinking about international growth. Unlike some peers, they they also appear to have identified lots and lots of uh, sources of, of growth ra- of rather than, yeah, where they're, rather than hunkering down. Sure. I mean, do you think this sort of complexity around the business and maybe the, I suppose, the interest rate sensitivity, you know, of their capital and balance sheet means that the market is always just going to apply a bit of a discount? I think, uh, well, I think that, I think uh, certainly it's been a somewhat misunderstood mm. stock because of the mix, essentially, of uh, uh, of asset and wealth management uh, and also a growing annuity business, as it were. But um, certainly having taught myself some time ago to you know, Andrew Rossi, the, the new chief executive, he believes having that mix is a great strength and uh, you know, gives them a, a, you know, a real growth opportunity when maybe the traditional investment management sector is, is under more pressure. Uh, so he sees it as a plus, and I think the market will increasingly see it as a uh, as a plus. But I agree, it is a slightly com- a more complex um, business. Also, of course, in terms of you know potential takeovers, and they are mooted, have been from time to time. Uh, it 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 doesn't make a potential takeover of a company the size of M and G any any easier because of the different activities it's in. There's not there's not one predator, as it mm. were, who would be the ideal person to take all, all sections over. You probably need a, some sort of partnership approach if that ever happened. But um, I'm not uh, looking for a, necessarily for a takeover of M and G. I'm very happy uh, with the, the the dividend yield payout, as it were, and the prospects of of, of growth from the business. Just two points in there. They, I mean, like you said, I think since we first spoke about them in episode one they're up about fifths so you know showing it's not just been an income story there has been some capital growth as well that pushes them slightly out of your golden seven seven uh ratio does that change the equation for you or is i mean they're still undervalued relative to lng and, and aviva and phoenix and, and others yes so. i think there's still a degree of undervaluation so i don't think they're they're, they're fully valued by any means i mean i mean they yield eight percent at the moment my view is that probably Given their their strength and optimism, uh, I I would have thought they should be on a six percent yield rather than an eight percent right. yield. So, uh, I you know I think theoretically there is that price movement upwards to bring that yield that yield down, and hopefully we will begin to see that as as more people 
you know, recognise the uh, near certainty of uh, dividend, ma- at least maintenance, yep. and, and probably gentle growth. That dividend, from the, the final dividend at least, is going to be paid on the 9th of May. You talked about the other dividends you've got coming into your portfolio from other big insurer holdings. A little way out, but were you to use it today, would you be putting it back into MNG or, or other large holdings, or are you looking to recycle it? Elsewhere, you know, I think that um, well, I may t- I may take a, you know a little out for uh, sort of personal expenditure, sure, uh, maybe one or two tax bills where you know I've taken profits in stocks outside my ISA and where where one does have to pay uh, pay uh, capital gains tax. But certainly there'll be there'll be some reinvestment. I think I'll be tending to to top up a number of smaller holdings that I've got where I think there is considerable undervaluation. You know, I feel that I'm I'm now pretty heavily represented in this grouping of um, Aviva Legal and General MNG, which which generate this great dividend, tax-free dividend income. So I think I'd be looking to top up some of my smaller holdings and maybe open one or two new, uh, you know, one or, one or two new areas of investment as well. Okay, we'll be interested to find out what those... Uh, proved to be in the weeks ahead. Lots to explore again, as ever, on our next episode, which of course includes any questions you'd like to put to John, which you can do by emailing me at alex.newman at ft.com. Until then, all that's left for me to say is to thank you for listening. Thank you, John, um, as ever, for your thoughts. Thank you. And, and time. And to thank our producer, Maddie Apthorpe, for all her work behind the soundboard. Until next time. Mm-hmm.